Uh, to introduce myself, I'm Darren Wolf. I presently blog as the International Libertarian. And I'm former Eastern Vice Chair of the Libertarian Party of Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm the area contact for Come Home America, which is a politically neutral uh, peace movement. <clears throat> and as you can see, the title of my talk is There Is No Case for Gun Control. So <clears throat> before I go on, of course, I have to thank Democracy Unplugged, Bob and Walter, for, uh, and the rest of you for putting on the event. I thank all of you for coming out here tonight. A fundamental question that we have here is, is self-defense a right or a privilege granted by politicians? You see, no issue can be looked at in a vacuum. Therefore, the gun issue, as with any other issue, we have to look at basic principles and moral implications. And what that means is we have to look at that one moral imperative that drives us in all human relationships, the non-aggression principle. It is immoral to initiate the use of force uh, against peaceful people. This means somebody has to be actually engaging in violent behavior or very credibly threatening to do so before it is morally justifiable to use force in self-defense. Now, what does this have to do with guns? Well, the mere possession of an inanimate object, such as a gun, aggresses against nobody. There is no moral justification for using force to separate people from their guns as long as they are adhering to the non-aggression principle. Property rights are part of the equation also. People have a right to their property. Guns are property. Use, separating people from their weapons by force is theft of those guns. I'm sure that we all agree that theft is immoral, right? And <clears throat> there is a moral justification for, uh, at times, using force, and that is self-defense. If the uh, initiation of force is immoral, the right to self-defense seems obvious. Taking away people's, uh, people's guns is taking away their ability to defend themselves. And this is just another way that gun control is a violation of people's rights. Now, before anybody says, that sounds very nice in theory, but doesn't really play out in that way in the real world, I say, let's take a look at how this actually works in the real world. To talk about all the tyrannical governments that have killed, enslaved, raped, tortured, imprisoned, exiled, and stolen from the people they've disarmed, it would take more than the two hours we have allotted to the entire event. Gun control is, in reality, people control. And it actually goes back to some very racist roots. For example, in Maryland, the law once read that no Negro or other slave within this province shall be permitted to carry any gun or any other offensive weapon. In Nazi Germany, the law read Jews are prohibited from acquiring, possessing, and carrying firearms and ammunition, as well as truncheons or stabbing weapons. Whether it's not allowing African Americans to have guns in the US, or not allowing Jews to have guns in Nazi Germany, the intent is the same, to have disarmed victims incapable of resistance. In the bloody 20th century, Mao Zedong summed it up perfectly. He said, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Governments want disarmed victims. This is exactly what Mao had in mind, and there are over 70 million dead Chinese to prove it. And they're only part of the over 200 million people murdered by governments during the 20th century. Every major genocide was done by a government that implemented some kind of gun control. So this is why there is never a good time to talk about disarming the people. What the conversation should be about is disarming the government. There's some, there's some gun control I can get behind. 
There is a massive imbalance between the power of the government, which is up here somewhere, and the power of the people, which is way down there somewhere. Not only the military, <clears throat> but the law enforcement establishments in this country are overwhelmingly strong. We need to start shifting that power away from the government by putting these functions back in the hands of the people where they belong. <clears throat> One of the lesser known founders, an anti-federalist by the name of Tench Cox, explained it well. He was actually picking up on the same theme as Mao when he wrote, who are the militia? Are they not ourselves? Is it feared then that we shall turn our arms, each man against his own bosom? Their swords and every other terrible implement of the soldier are the birthright of an American. The unlimited power of the sword is not in the hands of either the federal or state governments, but where I trust in God, it will ever remain in the hands of the people. There's only one way to guarantee our lives and liberties, that's to be stronger than those who seek to take them are. And as an example, here we go. As an example in relatively modern times of armed people standing up for their rights, I would offer the Deacons for Defense and Justice. Starting in 1964 in Jonesboro, Louisiana, they eventually spread to have 21 chapters across the Deep South. Though they never numbered more than a few hundred men, their armed protection has been credited with saving the civil rights movement from destruction by the Klan and law enforcement. Now today, gun control is held to be a matter of reducing crime and making society safer. I think the first half of my presentation has laid to rest any ideas that gun control will make us safer from the government. When it uh, comes to uh, crime though, there are two major hurdles that the advocates of gun control simply cannot overcome. If one is going to argue that the availability of guns is the problem, how do the advocates of gun control explain that for the last 20 years, that is overall nationwide, for the last 20 years, the murder rate and crime rates have been coming down. At the same time, gun control has been lessening, or you could say gun rights have been more respected, and the number of guns out there is greater than ever. Gun ownership is as high as it's ever been, if not higher. How do you explain this if you're going to say it's the guns that are the problem? Uh, the other hurdle that can't be overcome is this. <clears throat> If you look at days gone by, even going back into the 19th century, you see that there was less crime and lower murder rates. This was, uh, this was a time when you could mail order guns even at some, at some point. You could mail order guns with no background check, no registration. So how is anybody going to say that background checks and gun registration are big solutions when we actually had less crime and less murder before we had these things? Now, one problem with discussing crime is that we can get into a statistics war. This happens all the time. Uh, a study is produced. The study is debunked. The debunking is debunked, and it just back and forth it goes. So we need to cut through all this nonsense. When it comes to crime, there is no 100% definitive statistical proof either way. Gun control and gun ownership are not panaceas that will wipe out crime completely. And the reason for this is that there are many factors that influence the crime and the murder rate, and not just the availability of guns. One thing that we do see is that within the United States especially, um, more guns in decent people's hands tends to push the crime rate down. Now I'd like to give an example of how statistics, uh, how statistics can be confusing and deliberately manipulated, however you want to look at it. Uh, there is statistical manipulation. Some people deliberately misrepresent statistics. And some people honestly misinterpret what they're looking at. And I'd like to give an example of how that might work. Um, <clears throat> from the outset of the 1982 Chicago handgun ban to 2007, Chicago's murder rate averaged 17% less than it did before the ban. Now, advocates of gun control uh, can, to some degree, understandably look at numbers like that and say, you see, you see, it's working. 
their murder rate is down. But if you look at the if you look at the all the numbers, you'll see that from there in that same period, 82 to 2007, the national murder rate averaged 25 percent less than before Chicago's handgun ban. Chicago actually lagged behind the rest of the nation in reducing its murder rate. This, I would call the failure of gun control, even in the face of a declining murder rate. Here's, here's I think, one of the major reasons why it happened that way. So every year, more than two million crimes are prevented by people that point or brandish their weapons at criminals. Not fire them, not shoot the criminals, but use their guns to deter or stop a crime without firing them. Chicagoans were denied the ability to do this, and they suffered for it. One way that we can actually reduce the crime rate, the murder rate, is to take away the forces that are driving it. And on that note, I'd like to offer a solution that should go over well with both libertarians and people on the left. We tend to agree on this. And that would be to end the war on drugs, one of the major drivers of crime. Uh, I'd like to read from here. Uh, over there. One obvious solution to rampant gun violence has been often been downplayed or overlooked, ending drug prohibition. It goes on to say, as members representing the full spectrum of opinion on gun control, we know that reducing gun violence has little to do with either gun control or gun rights. And what I forgot to do is tell you what this is. It is from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition's website. Sorry about that, I should have said that first. Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, that's uh, leap.org. <clears throat> so if you, want to, if you want to reduce the murder rate, I think this would be a good way to do it. And one thing they point out about the prohibition on alcohol, back uh, in the, was it, 20s and 30s, that's what drove the murder rate up. When they repealed the prohibition back in the 30s, even in the middle of the depression, the murder rate dropped precipitously. We can do that again today by repealing the war on drugs. Now, moving on to another subject, some people say that we don't need guns, civilians don't need guns because the police will protect us. Yes, some, <laughs> I, last time I said this, I think I got a little more laughter. But anyways, it's a serious subject. Um, people need to reconsider this point of view. Uh, the police have no legal obligation to protect anybody. This has been affirmed by the courts in cases such as Warren v. District of Columbia and Ford v. Town of Grafton. Uh, matter of fact, in the latter case, Catherine Ford was advised by the police to get a gun to protect herself from her ex-husband. Uh, she uh, ignored that advice. She ended up shot and paralyzed. Uh, the police know they can't protect us. Uh, we should know better, too. Sometimes the uh, anti-gunners, as I sometimes call them, like to point to certain parts of Europe and their lower murder rates to say, look, you see, gun control is working over there. <clears throat> and here they ignore some uh, inconvenient facts, things uh, such as this. Uh, Finland and Switzerland actually have high rates of gun ownership, yet they have very low murder rates, especially Switzerland uh, has a very low murder rate. While there are a number of European countries with strict gun control and low rates of gun ownership, but high murder rates, Russia uh, leads the uh, unfortunate pact, pact, I should say, uh, with a murder rate four times that of the United States. And this is actually an improvement over a few years ago. The murder rate was uh, approaching one of the highest in the world. <clears throat> Other European countries that have higher murder rates in the United States include the Ukraine, Estonia, Belarus, Lithuania, Moldova, and some statistics I've looked at included Greenland as part of Europe. That also has a high murder rate, though I'm not so sure I would consider Greenland Europe, but anyways. Uh, also keep in mind that in the United Kingdom, their murder rate went up after their gun ban in 1997. It didn't go down, it went up. Uh, well, obviously not Europe. Australia had the same experience with their gun ban around the same time, their murder rate went up. 
Uh, there's no doubt, in my mind at least, that a gun ban in the United States would drive our murder rate up. I think one only need look at Chicago to see that. <clears throat> While we're looking around the world, it's worth noting that there are a number of countries that have higher murder rates than the United States. I uh, put on the slide Brazil, because it's known to have a very low rate of gun ownership and a murder rate that is four or five times higher than the United States. What I did here was I printed out a list of countries that have higher murder rates than the United States. So you go all the way down the first page and then you actually have to go all the way down the second page before you come to the United States. In other words, there are about 100 countries around the world. It's uh, Europe, Africa, Asia, the Americas. All of these countries that have higher murder rates than the United States. So I say let's put aside, let's put aside a lot of the noise that we hear about the United Can States. Can we share? Can you please come to the main circulation desk? Thank you. Let's put aside the noise that you hear about the United States being a very dangerous place with a particularly high murder rate. The truth is that the U.S. murder rate is below the world average. It is not, the United States is not a particularly dangerous place. I'd like to emphasize that there is no case for gun control. The moral arguments dictate that we not initiate the use of force to disarm peaceful people. The statistical evidence argues against it, as does the history of tyrannical and murderous governments. Now, a people that are armed and organized to defend themselves are safer people. Well, let me conclude this part of my talk with a test. Let's see who does it. All in favor of gun control, raise your right hand. Nobody? Well, that's good. So thank you. I guess now it is time for Q&A. Yeah, I'm for gun control, but, but, but I didn't want to. To the microphone. Get messed up with it. I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not capable of refuting you directly in many things you say, but let me offer seven things, just one or two sentences apiece. Your intention in having a lot of guns is self defense against bad guys. But if you look at a morality, not of intention, which comes before things happen, but of consequence, what happens when people have guns? What you'll find is they don't hold off bad guys. Well, sometimes they do, but a very good many of them kill good guys. They kill the kids in the house, they kill the owner of the gun from suicide, they kill people from accidents. That's one thing. Two, Western democracy is built on the fact that the government has a monopoly on lethal force. And if it's democracy, those using the lethal force are accountable. This, what you're suggesting reminds me of militias all over the place, uh, really bad militias. The Ku Klux Klan, skinheads, Cubans who are going to invade the country. Uh, I'd rather have the government having the guns in a democracy. Uh, one thing I remember an author saying is that we have so many guns in the United States because of the Civil War. We had the Civil War because of slavery. If we didn't have sleep, do you want me to address these things like one at a time? Because no. there's no way I'm going no, to be able to go I'll back. I'll be very quick. No, there's no way I'm going to go if back. If we didn't have slavery, we wouldn't have had all the guns that were left around in the 1860s after the Civil War. The local guy that I identified mostly with guns had a uh, gun shop. I think his name was Daniel Tavis or something like that on Penn Street down here. He was killed by a gun, even though he was the only person you ever saw with a holster walking around. Uh, he was killed, by the way, when someone robbed him and hit him over the head. He died of a head injury. Um, gun ownership is one thing, but are the guns in gun clubs? Are the guns on farms? Are the guns in private homes in city? Well, England. I'm, Joe, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to address here. Okay. All right. I'll stop. No, I'm just, if you have a question, please ask it. I have comments that tend to give evidence against you. Well, that's I, why I told I you I'm not directly refuting you. Well, that's why I asked if you wanted me to address these things one at a time. Should I go back more slowly? That's what I was asking you. Well, compare us to England. We're more like the English, I think, than any of the other nations you mentioned. 
maybe more like Canadians, from Bears to them. Well, okay, the English. Um, matter of fact, I was reading this book. Uh, it's called Guns and Violence, The English Experience. This is from Harvard University Press. And it shows very clearly that the English achieved their low murder rate way back in the 19th century, before they had gun control. The, this book go, documents from the Middle Ages on a declining murder rate. Um, they did it without gun control. Uh, I don't know what to say. But they keep it low with gun control. No, now England is a very dangerous place. London is a very dangerous city. Uh, people fear being robbed all the time. Home invasions are rampant. <laughs> I'm not sure that I see what you're getting at here. Well, is we, the murder rate higher than the United States then with all this danger? How, compare how many murders in the United States last year, how many in England? Uh, yes, the United States has a higher murder rate. Uh, but, well, then maybe gun control was working there. No, because they had their lower murder rate before they had gun control. Yes, but continuing with gun control kept it. You don't know that. You're assuming it because you like gun control. Well, there is a correlation. The correlation is not causality. Strict correlation strongly suggests. Again, that I could say no. They, their gun control is what gave them their low. I mean, gun rights, gun ownership is what gave them their lower murder rate. That's how their murder rate came down in the 19th century. You're not. Do you, you're want, to, not, do you want to address another one of my claims? Sure. How about? distinguishing between the intention of having a gun and the actual consequences of having one when it kills your wife, when it kills you in suicide, when your child uses it to kill his brother or sister. How about that? Uh, compared to the two million crimes that are prevented every year, guns are, you know, uh, guns are overwhelmingly used for good in civilian hands. Civilians kill fewer people by accident than the police do. Um, I would say one thing, suicide is a personal decision. I wouldn't, I, I, if somebody chooses to kill themselves, that's their choice. But I would, but on that subject, I would point out that pretty much gun-free Japan has a suicide rate much higher than ours. Probably yeah. because of its religion. Well, okay, I don't know about that, but I'm just saying they're gun-free and they have a very high suicide rate. So you can point to examples that go the other way too. Uh, the intention of guns, I say, look, let's look at the deterrent effect of guns, how it deters crime. You can look at, look at New Jersey. You have uh, Trenton, Camden, and they have very strict gun control and very high murder rates and crime rates. There can be many things that deter crime. Absolutely. For instance, other religions, other things. Yes. What about Western democracy? Are you opposed to Western democracy's idea that the government should have a monopoly on lethal force? The government should have the army. The government should have the police because the government is accountable and if they abuse that power, it can be ousted. I'm sorry, but um, I, I think that this idea of the government being accountable is a complete fantasy. Uh, governments, as I was showing, are tyrannical. They are murderous. The U.S. government, look what we did to, to, the, to the Native Americans. Uh, With I, guns. Because we yes, have guns in guns the government's hands. Guns in the government's hands. Remember I said, who are the militia? Are they not ourselves? Is it feared that the guns in the people's hands as opposed to the government's hands? No, I'm not a believer in Western Are those stuff. people, the KKKs and the militia that the Southern, well. The KKK was opposed by the deacons for defense and justice who were an armed group who defended themselves. And never achieved much of a reputation. I never heard of them before. Yes, because they went against the mainstream of the civil rights movement, which was nonviolence. Martin Luther King did what he could to suppress uh, information about them. Did Martin Luther King succeed without guns? There may be some other questions. No, he did not. He did. He did Most not. He, had on, he applied for, a, Martin Luther okay. King applied for a permit to carry a gun in Georgia, which they denied to him. That's not what his so, success was. And then he also had armed guards. That's not what his success was. He okay. marched with could, the could we, move on, could we move on to other people's questions? Does anybody else have a, yeah, I have a question? Actually, Bob, you have a question. Yeah, uh, and this was actually came up uh, when last time when we did the gun forum in media, <clears throat> and uh, which uh, <clears throat> uh, there was a Mayor John Linder of Chester was actually asking people, okay, Chester has one of the highest rates of violence uh, in this country. And a lot of it, as you mentioned, is connected with drugs and poverty. Okay. 
But John Lindsay, um, he wasn't necessarily talking about gun control, but he was asking, okay, in a city like Chester, in a city like Camden, in Liverpool, in the UK, okay, <clears throat> what, what can government do? What can the mayor, what can the city council, what can the police do to deal with the high rate of violence? I like to go with Henry David Thoreau, who said that the government never helped any cause except with the alacrity with which it got out of the way. Uh, the failure of the institutions that they have in cities like Chester, institutions like the police, who cannot control crime, um, institutions like the government that suppresses economic activity leading to the poverty, uh, the government's education system, which is failing the people, all of these things are what are driving <coughs> crime. And of course, having a, having a government police force enables the war on drugs. There's a correlation there. The government has power, so it starts to try to do things like enforce prohibition on alcohol, prohibition on, on drugs. The answer is that the government actually can't do anything. It needs to just get out of the way. The government, in my opinion, is causing the problem. Does, is there a case for gun control involving <coughs> uh, the size of cartridges and the, the uh, killing rate of weapons? No. Absolutely, no case absolutely not. Um, I'm reminded of reading history again. When they introduced the revolver, it was, oh, it's the great killing machine that's going to massacre. Now we would look back on the revolver as some big killing machine and laugh. Um, every time there's, there's technology advancing into it, it's like the rates of firepower and all that, this kind of thing comes up. But you up. think the AK-47 is a perfectly fine? Sorry. Would, would it be all right if I bought myself an armed drone and used it on my neighbor? Let's separate one thing here. Ownership is one thing. Use, especially to hurt people, is quite another. I mean, the Hell's Angels were famous for their hammers that they used as weapons. I mean, we're not going to have little hammers. I think that if you, you theoretically want to talk about a drone, I see that as something of a scare tactic to try to scare people about, oh, gee, you're a scary. drone. It's scary, but it's also implausible. What are you going to use a drone for? What are you going to use an AK-47 for? To defend yourself. To, to be, defend yourself? To be part of a militia to defend the country. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Are there any other questions? No. Thank you very much, Carol. That was a very interesting talk. I, I don't know anything quite like it. And, uh,